Welcome to Around the Empire. This is a fully independent podcast. Lend your support, patreon.com slash around the empire, rockfin.com slash around the empire, paypal.me slash around the empire pod. Also, please like, share, and subscribe. I'm your host, Joanne Leon, co-host Dan Wright, and our guest today is Matthew Ho. We had a wide-ranging discussion about the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the response to losing a war, the media coverage over the past 20 years, and the bad actors we were allied with throughout the war. But now, upon leaving, the outrage and sudden concern for the Afghan people. Over the years, so many lies were told that this whole war seems like a big lie. We also talk about why the evacuation went so badly, the National Security Council, the British freakout, and more. And in a bonus segment, we talk about the opium trade in Afghanistan and the Taliban pledge to shut it down. Matthew Ho is a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy in Washington, D.C. He's a member of the Eisenhower Network. He's a disabled veteran, a former U.S. Marine Corps officer, and a Department of Defense and State Department official. Matthew was in the Iraq War with the Marines and in both Afghanistan and Iraq with the State Department teams. He writes and speaks regularly on issues of war and peace. He has appeared on numerous media networks, and his work has been published by a wide array of online and print media. We recorded this on August 26, 2021. Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon. Hosting with me today is the co-founder of the podcast, Dan Wright, and our guest, we are so happy to have Matthew Ho back on the show. Hello, Matthew. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. It's great to see you. Hi, Joanne and Dan. Thank you for having me back on. So today, oh, go ahead, ahead, Dan. I was just saying, cool. Go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, well, I mean, for... We're recording this on uh, Thursday afternoon, um, and of course, there's news breaking all around us about Afghanistan because there's just been an attack uh, near a gate in Kabul, at the airport in Kabul and at a hotel, and we're just starting to hear about casualties and such. Um, we did plan to talk about Afghanistan today. Anyway, uh, the last time that Matt was on, and I'll, I'll link this episode for... Uh, for you to go go back to because we talked about the Afghanistan papers uh, and the culture of lying about this war, which, you know, this is just kind of part two now, Matt. None of us are, this is tragic in so many ways, um, but we are not all that surprised. Of course, I had hoped that it didn't, that the withdrawal didn't go the way it has and certainly didn't hope for any attacks or things like that. But, you know, I've also been thinking about all the veterans who served in Afghanistan, um, people like Matt and many others. I don't know how many now, a million? How many troops did we have in Afghanistan, Matt? Uh, I think the total number was 800,000 um, and some crazy percentage uh, served multiple deployments there. And some even crazier percentage served more than or, or performed more than five. I don't like using the word served, um, performed more than five deployments to Afghanistan. And one uh, overall total in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, 2.7 million Americans uh, were deployed to those wars. And it's really difficult to um, decouple uh, those wars. So because many of us were in both places. So, yeah. So, I mean, people like you've been on my mind uh, lately, too, in all, all of our minds. Thank you. You know, though we're glad, of course, I think we can all say we're glad that we're leaving, This is the, that this war is ending. We hope it really is ending. Um, but nobody wanted it to happen this way. And it's just, it's just been such a tragedy from start to finish that um, yeah, I just hope everybody's doing okay uh, through this and that we get through this in the best possible way. So I guess that's what I've been, I thought maybe we could just start out with, you know, what are your thoughts about what you see going on around you and the way this whole thing has played out? Well, I mean, this was inevitable. 
Um, this was the this is what defeat looks like. This was um, what was going to happen for as long as the United States had uh, uh, had a policy of military victory in Afghanistan. Um, for, for most of the last two decades, the United States uh, operations in Afghanistan, its policy, its goals, et cetera, were simply uh, the defeat of the Taliban and military victory um, and primarily military victory, I believe, uh, for domestic political reasons. Um, and then there are some other reasons as well I, we could get into. But uh, this is what this is the consequences of that. When you attempt to win militarily and you do not, this is what defeat looks like. Um, so this was inevitable. Uh, however, the uh, inevitability of it, with it, of it can also be countered by the fact that if the United States had chosen to do things differently, um, you know, even, even in the, the sense of, you know, even besides the sense of not invading and occupying Afghanistan in 2001, um, I mean, there are many periods throughout uh this uh, these last 20 years, the United States could have chosen different approaches, even after it was militarily engaged to bring about a political solution to the war that would have offered different outcomes. Um, but the United States policy, again, was one strictly of military victory. You know, the, 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 the man who's in charge of the Taliban now, uh, Mullah Akhazada, uh, uh, he. Uh, he became head of the Taliban in 2016 uh, because the United States had killed the previous head of the Taliban in a drone strike in 2016. So anyone who thinks that the United States was somehow engaged in attempting to end the war politically or, or, or engaged uh, in any type of honest or viable negotiations is, is, is kidding themselves. You know, and then this lasts up until 2018 when Donald Trump decides to negotiate with the Taliban. And that decision is based entirely upon Donald Trump's ego and his desire to use ending the Afghan war as a uh, fulfillment of a campaign promise. Um, and, and, you know, but one of the, I think what we should gather from that is when Trump in September of 2018 sends Zalmay Khalazad to talk with the Taliban, discussions get right underway. And within a year, a deal is concluded. You know, and then, of course, in September of 2018, uh, September 2019, temp, Trump throws a temper tantrum and then the agreement is not signed for another six months. But th this, the fact that just that, that fact there, that, 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 that display there, that as soon as Kyle Azad engaged with the Taliban, they engage with him and a, a, a real negotiation process ensues, just totally belies the lie that the United States has offered for two decades now that the Taliban did not want to negotiate. So just understanding that just demonstrates that there were other ways the United States could have pursued its objectives in Afghanistan um, other than through military victory. And of course, there are a lot of other things. I mean, again, the United States could just not have done this. You know, I mean, and, and you could even say that the United States could have still pursued Al Qaeda without doing this. Uh, I mean, there, there are a lot of different um, there are a lot of different branches or paths the United States could have uh, uh, gone forward with or, 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 try, or attempted. A lot of different outcomes could have, have, have occurred. But, you know, ultimately, I mean, was there really ever any option for the U.S. empire but to pursue this path? And, and I'm, I'm certain you guys uh, are feel the same way I do, that there's, and this, is, this is how empires exist. This is how they function. And I primarily see the purposes of the last 20 years of uh, the U.S. in Afghanistan is, you know, uh, uh, preserving, repairing and expanding American empire, uh, as well as the glory of the presidencies. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the idea of I, I don't believe there were very um, I don't believe there are primary economic reasons for the United States entering the entering Afghanistan in 2001. I mean, certainly there were secondary and tertiary. And as we've certainly seen, you know, this reports this past week that you know, two trillion dollars went to just five weapons companies over the last twenty years. I mean, yes, the, I'm not dismissing the economics of this, the the the, the extraction uh, of of what's occurs here, the looting. You know, the, the corporate gift that these wars have been. But in terms of the decision making, why the Bush administration chose to do what it did in Afghanistan, unlike Iraq, say, um, I, I do believe that this was about repairing the humiliation done to the empire punishing those who stood up against the empire, 
um, telling others that, you know, showing others that this type of dissent against American primacy will not be tolerated. Um, as well, and two, I think you have to look at um, who was in the Bush White House, National Security Council, Pentagon, State Department. These are all the neoconservatives from the Chicago School, the, the Paul Wolfowitzes, right? The, the, uh, the people who had, uh, you know, Zame Khalazads, the people who had uh, authored the Project for a New American Century. These were uh, the neoconservative uh, uh, who believed in not just expanding the empire for the empire's sake, but expanding the empire as some sort of quasi-religious obligation to expand American values, uh, you know, this, this, this American exceptionalism. Um, and, and so I think that helps understand how this war begins. And then, of course, um, the continuation of it, uh, uh, you know, a lot, of, like I said, a lot of other options, but it always comes back to military victory, military victory, military victory, until we have a president like Trump whose ego is bigger than the needs of the empire. And also to, as well to the glory of the presidency, which is, I really do think, uh, you know, the way to understand Bush and Obama's uh, war objectives. Uh, and that's just not me saying, I mean, lots of other people have said this, but most, most importantly, the Washington Post, which no one will mistake as a critic of American empire, <laughs> um, right? I mean, and they did say, the Post does say in its Afghan papers from 2019, which, you know, describe the, the systemic, which detail, you know, through the interviews of more than 400 senior American officials, both military and civilian, which, which details the systemic lying of these wars, that, you know, the Post comes to the conclusion that, you know, this is really about uh, domestic political, these wars were really about domestic political concerns more than anything else. Hey, can we go into the systemic aspect? Because you brought up an interesting point, And now that we're I guess leaving, people are finally willing to ask cultural mismatch questions, which is would have been probably better 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And one of the ones that's being brought up um, in relation to a New Yorker reporter, Dexter Filkins, who wrote a book called The Forever War, I guess in 2006, is this idea of a mismatch between how the military viewed combat and how the sort of traditions of Afghanistan, I guess, Pashtun Wali, whatever the ter term is, yeah. for how they viewed it. And I just want to pull a quick quote um, from the Dexter Falcons. People fought in Afghanistan and people died, but not always in the obvious way. They've been fighting for so long, 23 years then, that by the time the Americans arrived, the Afghans had developed an elaborate set of rules designed to spare as many fighters as they could. So the war would go on forever. Men fought, men switched sides, men lined up and fought again. War in Afghanistan often seemed like a game of pickup basketball, a contest among friends, a tournament where you never knew which team you'd be on. The next game got underway. Shirt skins on Tuesday, you might be part of the fearsome Taliban regiment running into a minefield. And on Wednesday, you might be manning a checkpoint for some gang of the Northern Alliance. By Thursday, you could be back with the Talibs again, holding on your Kalashnikov and promising to wage jihad forever. War was serious in Afghanistan, but not that serious. It was part of everyday life. It was a job. Only civilians seemed to lose. And so that goes to kind of a point of how we have a view of what we were doing there, or at least that was presented to the public. I'm not on the inside, so I have no idea of we're doing this counterinsurgency. We're going there to eliminate terrorists. We're doing seek and destroy missions. And the locals had their own kind of view of what was actually going on. And there's this kind of mismatch where, okay, well, I'm with the Taliban today, or maybe I'll switch sides. And I wonder if this tremendous collapse is part, partly due to the fact that these guys made deals and a lot of people ran and some people just said, okay, I'll just surrender. And so instead of 90 days or 60 days or whatever the CIA told Biden, they all just sort of capitulated once we said we were leaving. Does that make sense to you or is that a misread? Well, I, I think Filkins is a, a, a greatly overhyped and over-exaggerated reporter. I think he gets more wrong than he gets right on these wars. Um, I think his understanding of the war is terribly, and this was from 2006, I think his understanding of the war is terribly, um, um, he terribly misrepresents it. The idea that somehow the United States arrives in Afghanistan as if we just showed up, as if we are just, you know, I remember this description one time somebody made, um, you know, of, you know, Afghanistan's like you're walking past a bar and there's a bar fight and a bottle flies out and hits you in the head and you run in and then you get involved in it. Totally, you know, that only, that only is true is if you're the one who started the bar fight, kept the alcohol flowing, put more, you know, uh, punched more people 
you know, they get to fight. Right. Continue. I mean, like, so his notion that somehow the United States just arrives in Afghanistan because of the events of 9-11, as if we are some sort of innocent bystander, kind of mind, you know, minding our own business and we're attacked on 9-11, which is the dominant, you know, theme in, in, in the United States, which is certainly, I mean, you, you, you talk on American media, uh, uh, you know, American corporate media uh, about how uh, the United States, uh, uh, the 9-11 attacks were the result of events previous to that, particularly the United States bombing, uh, sanctioning, occupying, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, staging coups, propping up despotic regimes, et cetera, et cetera. You bring that up, uh, and you are looked as, uh, you know, as a heathen. You are looked as, as that's that's blasphemy. That's anathema. And so, by the way, Filkins frames all that. If you frame the war that way, then I don't think you're going to get it correct. You know, and, and and I think the oversimplification of Afghans into one monolith or the Pashtuns into one monolith, that they are simply just following, they've always been fighting that BS when, no, it's they haven't always been fighting. They've been fighting because other foreign countries have been involved in their country for centuries. Uh, you know, the, the king, uh, 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 the king who, who, who ruled Afghanistan from the 1920s to the 1970s, that was a period of peace in Afghanistan. Yeah, there are troubles, but find me a country that doesn't have trouble. You know, the, the wars in Afghanistan are a result of uh, foreign influence, of foreign meddling, of foreign, of attempted foreign manipulation. Um, you know, this this Afghan this this war is a living legacy of the Cold War. Um, yes, there was certain plenty. I don't want to deny any agency to uh, the Afghans in the '70s who were involved with assassinations and coups and and, and other things. But there is always a foreign presence or a foreign shadow involved with that. Um, and so this idea that somehow the, the, the Pashtuns are just, a, 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 if I heard that correctly, sort of a warlike people that just have always been fighting and always will be fighting. Well, if that's the, key, the reason is because people won't leave them alone. Right. You know, and Filkin's misunderstanding of Pashtun Wali is... Um, you know, I mean, it makes it the problem with that is that we, we make Afghans, we make Pashtuns, we make Iraqis, we make Yemenis, we make Syrians, you know, a, a, as if they're they're space aliens, as if they are a, a creature different than us. When, you know, um, the reality is, is that they're not they're human beings. And there are just as many reasons people join the Taliban as there are people who join the Taliban. You know, a lot of those you can do a Venn diagram and find common connections. And what, you know, we do find is that People join these insurgent groups, not just the Taliban, but say the Iraqi insurgency uh, that fought against the Americans, uh, the um, uh, 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 and, and you know uh, uh, groups all throughout Africa, uh, you know from uh, uh, Western Africa all the way to say Somalia. Uh, those insurgencies are populated uh, to a tune of anywhere from seventy to ninety percent by people who have joined these insurgencies. Um, as a way that they see to defend their community because they are on the wrong side of a divide and conquer strategy. Um, and as well as too, as, uh, as a direct result of uh, their families and friends being killed by either foreign forces or the proxy forces that uh, are supported by foreign forces. I mean, that's very clear. I mean, plenty of studies have been done by this. Plenty of, of leaked U.S. intelligence documents that prove this. I certainly knew this uh, when I was in the State Department and reading um, the intelligence we got from uh, what we call foreign fighters in Iraq, you know, uh, young men uh, and some women actually who came from other countries to fight the Americans and the British and, and so forth in Iraq. Um, that you know, when when they were when they were interrogated as to why did you come here to fight the Americans, it, it wasn't it wasn't about waging some type of, of jihad in the sense of that I'm going to get my place in heaven. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to martyr, be martyred and everything. There may be an element to that because that is in the, that can be in the culture that can be, you know, um, that can be discovered if you push far enough in a conversation. But the reason why they came, um, you know, again, well documented in our interrogations of, the, of these people was that, you know, that was because the United States had invaded Iraq. Uh, it was because of what they saw happening in Abu Ghraib, it was because of what happened in Guantanamo Bay. They came to Iraq to defend their fellow Muslims, to defend their Arab lands, to defend their culture against what they saw, rightly, as an invasion by the West 
to control them. And, you know, it's not, again, not like the war in Iraq starts March 19th. I think that's when it was, 2003. I mean, this has been going on for decades. You know, I mean, like literally we, we, the West is the one that created the modern country of Iraq. I mean, we're the, you know, literally, you know, diplomats, European diplomats draw the lines of these countries after the, the First World War. Um, so but that is so often left out in these discussions and understandings. And so I get I think you get to someone like Filkins, who is viewed upon as a sage, who is viewed, whose writings are 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 shared and are, are, are spoken of very highly. Uh, he, he writes for you know, New Yorker and other periodicals that have a lot of not just doesn't, doesn't have, have a large audience, but have a lot of authority. And unfortunately, I think that their, their basic understandings of what's occurring there is very uh, shallow. Uh, there's little nuance that relies upon uh, American tropes and narratives that when you examine them, just don't hold up. Okay. I agree with a lot of that actually. And I, I just, it's just, it's getting around. So I kept reading it like, Oh, I didn't even read it at the time, but it makes, I think what you're saying makes sense. I guess when I've, what makes me think when I go back to systemic failures and the way this was framed is the way the weaponization, if you will, of human rights logic or human rights presentation. And when you look at the sort of neocon cast central casting, mm-hmm. it seems that, they have framed this, and I do remember, it harkens back to that WikiLeaks cable that leaked about how the CIA was trying to get Europeans to, they said, oh, the numbers for support in Afghanistan are falling. We need to start talking about women's rights, women's yeah. rights. Uh, this was leaked by WikiLeaks, if you want to look it up. And Yeah, 2010. And, 2010. Yeah, and as we're seeing the withdrawal here, uh, as you know, problematic as it is, you're seeing people, uh, the same cast of characters who never seem to really talk about human rights much at all, certainly not when it comes to torture, um, suddenly saying, you know, we're abandoning the women of Afghanistan. They're going to be brutalized. They're going to be raped. You, this is what you're doing. You're, you know, we're complicit in their oppression and their, um, you know, subjugation. We're now basically helping the Taliban oppress women in the country. And beyond the sort of aspect of the fact that this women's paradise or feminist liberation is mostly in Kabul. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can we, what do you think of the framing as an imperial tool of using weaponizing human rights or intersectionalism? You know, we're going to fly the LGBT flag and this is for gays. Yeah. 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 What do you think of that as a tool? It reminds me of, uh, you know, even our domestic politics, I see uh, memes sometimes that describe the difference between uh, democratic and Republican border policy. You know, a Republican border policy seems to be you know, put everybody in cages and, uh, you know, Democratic border policy seems to be put everybody in cages, but make sure half the guards are women. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, like that. And, 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 you know, you see this point as well with like this now this concern for refugees when these same people who are supposedly livid that we are abandoning the people of Afghanistan to a human rights catastrophe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, which there is some truth to. Uh, but as you said, Dan, you know, the idea that somehow Afghanistan was some paradise of human rights, which we can get into, which is completely not. I mean, basically, we were, we, uh, the Taliban were, was a theocratic repressive government that we replaced with a kleptocratic repressive government. And so now the theocratic repressive government is back in charge. So the Afghans just have suffered uh, uh, regardless of who was in power. But, you know, these people who are so concerned about Afghan human rights, uh, you know, they're super cool with keeping people in cages on the border. You know, I mean, like so there and, and the fact I think it gets to the point of that our media does very little to hold people to account with what they have said, what they have said previously, um, that, that they claim to be based to what they're what they're doing to is 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 based upon principles and morality or value to bring up, you know, the fact that, look, you know, what you know, hey. Hey, you know, Senator so and so. Hey, Congressperson so and so. You know, you're so outraged about the Taliban, but you vote continually to sell hundreds of billions of dollars of weapons to the Saudis. You know, I mean, so I, I think there's a lot to that, the, the, the hypocrisy, but also too, there's the manufacturing of consent that goes on by the media. And I think this has been if people are, are not familiar with that term that was popularized by Noam Chomsky decades ago. And if people are kind of unfamiliar with how that works, I think this has been a really uh, amazing example of it, 
what you see in uh, Kabul right now, tens and tens of millions of Americans have seen video and photos of U.S. Marines giving waters, giving water bottles to Afghan toddlers. I mean, I, I've seen so many photos of American Marines holding Afghan babies in their arms or lifting Afghan babies over blast walls to the supposed safety and freedom that Kabul airport represents and is being popularized by American media. Meanwhile, in the last 20 years of direct American war in the United States, uh, there has been almost no coverage of the amazing, a massive, uh, 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 extensive amount of violence conducted against the Afghan people. You know, I, I, I used to do a lot of corporate media uh, 10, 12 years ago, and I haven't been on a corporate media for since 2014, and, and it's rare for any of us to get on it. Um, you know, I think in this last week and a half, Phyllis Bennis of IPS has gotten onto MSNBC once for like a three minute hit or something like that. And, you know, I mean, so voices like this are left out unless you are kind of a, unless you are somehow able to represent yourself in a team Biden uh, manner or a, a team MAGA or team red manner or team Republican manner. Um, but, you know, I remember being in, in 20. 10 or 2011, whenever Chelsea Manning's WikiLeaks uh, releases were, were, were put out and the famous uh, 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 helicopter murder video, right, the, the, of the Apache murdering those people, including journalists uh, and including an ambulance in Baghdad. I mean, amazing war crimes. Uh, and of course, it's the helicopter pilots laughing about it and everything. And I remember being on MSNBC and being asked about this and being, you know, um, and my reaction was simply, why are people amazed at this? What do you think we've been doing over there for these last 10 years? You know, what do you think that has been occurring in these wars? And so I find that a lot of the response to what's happening in Afghanistan now is incredibly infantile. Um, the idea that somehow there, that, that the, there are consequences for our military actions, that the, the enemy would fight back, that we could lose, or that this is what losing looks like. You know, that type of uh, uh, the, the outrage at how dare the Taliban win? Who are they to right? I mean, like so that that infantile response to this is very infuriating. But I think it's also very telling. But again, to the point about the media and their manufacturing consent. Um, yeah, I mean, again, you, you show Americans for these last two weeks, just video and video, very touching video of of US Marines and soldiers taking care of Afghan children. But for 20 years, you have shown no video of what the violence those same institutions have brought to the Afghan people. So um, I, I think that's a very important uh, thing for people to, to, to look into and to understand. Well, okay. Yeah, just following up on that about the media situation, what's been interesting for those of us who have followed it, uh, both, I'm sure, on this podcast, Joanne and I and Scott Horton and these other people who have been viewing it the whole, entire time, is the news was so bad from media for a while. There was this a Vice documentary that got a lot of play. This is what winning looks like, where they're interviewing soldiers on the ground who are saying they basically can't stop getting their Afghan, quote unquote, allies to stop raping children. I know that sounds yeah. very hyperbolic, but it, I'm not being hyperbolic. You can no, watch no. the video online. No. Uh, wow. The Northern Alliance reinstituted uh, practice, uh, I guess that translates roughly into dancing boys. Yes. Heroin trafficking was amazing. Hamid Karzai's brother was considered one of the biggest opium dealers in the country. All he, these he was, news... he was, uh, Karzai's yeah. brother was, you could argue, the biggest opium dealer in the world. Yeah, right, because of the production right. increases That's right. under our leadership while we're having an opioid crisis, yeah. Afghanistan, opium production is up 90 percent. So what's interesting about manufacturing consent is there's just this slow drip of terrible news, terrible news. It's all lost. Why are we even here? And mainstream media is letting it fly. They're not really objecting. And then suddenly when the withdrawal happens, we're leaving these people to it's all been great. And we're, we're their yeah. last best hope on Earth. And the kind of pivot the sort of party line shift in the Soviet Union, I guess they would call it, from, yes, we're going to report the truth that this war is not going well. Yes, we know this is a forever war. Yes, we know we're actually exacerbating certain problems. Yes, we know our allies are kind of corrupt and they don't have the faith of the people. Oh, but now we're going to do a 180 and say we were the last best hope. That's the part that's got to give me whiplash, at least. I don't know how you yeah. feel about it. Yeah, it's, I actually have a New York Times subscription because there's so much good evidence in the New York Times that that's who I cite very often. Like, so take these, take the drug lords. 
the New York Times continually for the last 20 years in its editorial or in its even in its news will say how the Taliban controls the drug trade. You know, the U.S. is fighting the, the, the drug trade there. The Afghan government is fighting the drug trade. And it's absolutely not true. I mean, the Afghan government has controlled the drug trade. And the New York Times has written brilliant pieces on this. Uh, a New York Times reporter goes into Hellman, uh, uh, visits with, um, oh shoot, I forget his first name. His last name is Akhandzada, uh, a very close friend of, of Hamid Karzai, opens the wrong door in this guy's house. And there's like, I forget how much, but 25 tons of opium, of opiates, you know, sitting in front of him, <laughs> right? I mean, like, and this was, I mean, this guy was the drug lord of Helmand, and he was Karzai's good friend. As we discussed, Karzai's half-brother, Ahmed Wali Karzai. Same, same thing, too, that the Times at Times will write these really great pieces um, detailing how Karzai controls, uh, AWK as we called him, how Karzai controls the drug trade in the South, and which makes him, like, the South of Afghanistan, the biggest opiate-producing part of the world, you know, so makes him the Pablo Escobar of, of opiates and heroin, right, and everything. And, um, you know, Times writes about this and, and, and Times cites Americans who say, we know this, you know, and how could you not know it? Uh, the, the Times writes uh, stories on uh, a guy that they called Marshall Fahim, uh, who uh, was uh, the biggest drug war lord in the North and who became the uh, Minister of Defense for uh, uh, this Afghan government. So literally the guy who's in charge of all the planes and helicopters we were giving to the Afghan army was one of the two or three biggest drug lords in Afghanistan and reported by the New York Times. But then, as you said, Dan, there's this disconnect where that reporting and the same thing, too, goes for Golag Sharzai, goes for Muhammad Adenor, you know, a whole host of other drug lords. Um, and the Post, the same thing, too. You can say the same thing at the Washington Post. The Washington Post uh, will publish things about how there is an alliance between Al Qaeda and uh, the Taliban, or, or how there have been you know, recently concerns about Taliban and Islamic State working together. Same time, though, the Washington Post has published really great reporting on how the United States has acted as the air force for the Taliban on many occasions in eastern Afghanistan as the Taliban have fought the Islamic State. And there's just no, um, you know, when, when, they, when they publish opinion pieces, when they write editorials, or, or even in their own reporting, it's as if they have just forgotten that or, or ignoring what their own reporting says about this. Yeah. I mean, and that's when I, when I, when I write about uh, these wars, I almost always try and cite, uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal, the Times, the Post, because that information is there. I don't have to go to like, I don't have to go to RT, you know, or someplace like this to find criticisms of what's happening in the United States wars, because the American, uh, uh, the American media has reported it, but then they pretend as if it didn't happen. I think the best, um, the best example is, of course, the Washington Post Afghan papers, which December 2019, the Post publishes a trove of documents uh, of more than 400 interviews of senior U.S. officials from throughout the, the, the men and women who, who were in all uh, uh, administrations, Republican and Democrat, that systematically details that this war was one big lie, that that was the driving force behind this war was lying. Um, and even with some of those who admitted that, uh, and who's and the Times, I mean, sorry, the Post had to go to court for three years to get these documents. Of the 400 or so interviews they had, only about 60 had names attached to them. Um, but even with those that they had names attached to, some of them, like Ryan Crocker, who you know has who said things very revealing about what he actually understood about the Afghan government, which is in complete contradictions to what Ryan Crocker is saying now, he is still uh, cited and commented on by the Washington Post, even though the Washington Post has documents that shows this guy is a complete liar. And the same on for all the other commentators that we see. Uh, I mean, these men and women have lied and it is not just, you know, it's just not someone like me or you guys pointing at their lies and pointing them out. This was, was exposed by an investigation by a newspaper owned by a man who has tens of billions of dollars of contracts with the Pentagon <laughs> and the intelligence community with, you know, Jeff Bezos. 
So, I mean, that is, that is like, if you want, you know, evidence of, of it, this is a really terrific source because there was no gain in it for the Washington Post to publish other than the fact that they somehow decided that they were going to pursue journalism in this case, which is, you know, I mean, so the dissonance that occurs, the, the, the forgetting of what they've written themselves and an allowing of voices that have not just been wrong about these wars, but have lied about these wars. I'm amazed that, you know, you see men like James Clapper and John Brennan, you know, uh, Brennan, the former director of the CIA, Clapper, the former director of national intelligence, who, you know, lied, perjured themselves in front of Congress, lied to the media constantly when they were in charge, you know, and in the things that they have said since being out of power and being contributors to CNN and MSC, wildly off the mark. I mean, say what you will about Donald Trump, you know, and I grew up in New York, so I've disliked this guy for you know, longer than most people. So we were all the same. Right, exactly. So, but you Atlantic why, City, baby. Okay, yeah, <laughs> right. But why, um, you know, the, the, the allowance for the lies about Trump when there is so much else that could have been discussed, that should have been discussed, that should have been commented on, but say like all the Russiagate stuff, which, you know, men like Clapper and Brennan were breathlessly reporting things that weren't true you know, leaking things, you know, that weren't true, you know, making pretend that they knew things that just weren't true, you know, I mean, so the lies over and over again. So, you know, you want to talk about an industry that not just manufacturing consent, but is inherently morally and intellectually broken. Uh, the American corporate media uh, completely is. Yeah, it's, I wish I could think of a better word for it, but it's like a big mind F, you know, it's like the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. Um, and it takes for me anyway, maybe it's a little slow, a little too trusting or naive, but I, I, I mean, I shouldn't be, I, when I was a child, one of the sort of earliest memories are after dinner, my parents would go and watch the nightly news and it was the Vietnam war, you know, it was the, and every night there was either, it was either black and white footage or faded color footage of, um, you know, troops on the ground in Vietnam and helicopters and hellish reports of, of things. So um, even before I understood anything about this, you know, I had siblings who were teenagers at the time and they were anti-war. So it sort of rubbed off on me, but it was more than that. It was just the whole dark, um, just those news reports every night. So I shouldn't be very idealistic is, is what I'm trying to say, but um, it takes yeah. a while to under, it takes a while to wrap your, you're not supposed to be able to wrap your arms around this, or I, I don't know, it's just gotten so twisted. Well, you know, and I'm glad you brought up Vietnam and the media coverage, because the American military comes out of that, and they really learn a lesson. Mil the media should not be our advers adversary, they should be our ally. Uh, General Petraeus writes his PhD dissertation on the media in Vietnam. And that's why you see, uh, you know, some particularly say with, uh, you know, throughout the 80s with Ronald Reagan, um, the, the uh, a beginning of, of a bomb between the American uh, media, American corporate media and the American military. Um, you know, it's certainly just the, the, the way the coverage was about the Reagan buildup about, you know, the, the, the evil Soviet empire, all those kinds of things, you know, that that continues to accelerate the goal, the first Iraq war in 1991 was a, 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 a media a, a, a fantasy. I mean, in terms of like the way cable news had just come on, the way satellite television coverage had come. I mean, the fact that the American military was willing to give uh, a, a video uh, from the bombs that were dropping into Iraqi buildings. I mean, this was a, a blessing for the, the new uh, American cable news industry. I mean, CNN had only been around for a couple of years at that time. Um, you know, and then, you know, and then, of course, that really unfolds in 2003 with the way the American military pursues the Iraq war, embedding people uh, into their, their troops, allowing access for those who talk correctly about the war, support the narrative. Uh, you know, I mean, so the American military really takes away the lesson that, um, look, the, the media should not be an enemy. It should not be an adversary. It should be an ally, not because we believe in press freedoms or anything like that, but because it is very useful to have on our side. And we have certainly seen that um, these last 20 years. Can we just go back a little bit to um, the fact that you, you talk about 
how this could have been done differently. There were opportunities. I mean, from the start, if you read Scott Horton's book and he, he mm. details some of the opportunities, like from day one, uh, when the opportunity to hand over bin Laden was there with some conditions, uh, we never even had to really get into this war. But then, like you said, all along the way, there were ways this could have been done differently. So let's bring that forward to this withdrawal. Um, do you think, I, I'm gonna leave this, I was gonna get more specific, but you know, what do you think happened? I'm gonna ask you to speculate a little bit uh, based on what you know from your experience there. Why did this not go sm more smoothly? Um, who, who screwed up the most? You know, who should be held accountable? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, th I think it's like, you know, um, uh, our, our friend David Swanson says a lot, you know, blame is like uh, sunlight, you know, just because someone gets some sunlight doesn't take away from others, right? So I think right, there's right. plenty, right? Um, I have actually heard in the last week or two from friends of mine who are still in the intelligence community and, and, and senior officers down in the Marine Corps, you know, colonel level, you know, right below general, um, that the National Security Council is absolutely paralyzed, that the National Security Council cannot make a decision about anything, um, you know, uh, and not just about uh, uh, what's happening in Afghanistan, but say also to what's happening with Haiti, uh, that, you know, I mean, you would uh, uh, just the, the idea of uh, whether you think it or not, you, you know, understanding the American perspective on this and whether or not it would be the right thing to do or not, um, the idea of sending a massive humanitarian force of Marines and soldiers and sailors or whatever to Haiti to help the, the propaganda victory that would be for the Americans right now with things going so bad in Afghanistan, um, you know, as well as the fact that maybe there could be some that good. I mean, I, I don't like saying that because but what Haiti does need now is manpower. I think the American military is always going to put the American military in a situation like that. And there's always a lot of danger a lot of danger. But from, again, from the perspective of people in the empire, in the National Security Council, at the White House, Pentagon, et cetera, their view, their mindsets on this, not your mindset, Joanne, not, not Dan's mindset, not mine, but you can understand how that would seem very attractive to them. And they can't even decide to do that. Um, so I think there's a lot of paralysis in decision-making. And I think it comes down to the type of people that are in those positions. Um, they have to weigh, they weigh everything that they do or say with the politics of it. Mm -hmm. And so they come up with a decision about something and then they wait to see what, uh, they watch CNN that night, they watch MSNBC that night to see whether or not what they're going to say tomorrow might fit with what's being said that night. So I, I think that there's a lot, the politics of this, uh, you know, even at those levels that you would think would be unaffected by the politics, Look, people who get to levels like at the joint, who, people who get to, um, you know, whether it be the policy planning section of the State Department, the uh, 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 Joint Chiefs uh, of, of the Pentagon, uh, the National Security Council, um, you know, yeah, there are some junior people on there who are learning, but the senior people don't get back into those positions without having a clear and real understanding of the politics within all DC institutions and the way they are influenced by, uh, you know, the media, say. So I, I think there's just been a lot of paralysis, a lot of, 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 of being afraid to be blamed for something that has hindered any type of, as well as too, the, the, there are things you are not allowed to say. Look, when I was in Iraq my first time uh, in 04, 05, it wasn't until late 04 or early 05 that we were allowed to use the word insurgency. Right. So, I mean, for almost two years, yeah, before, that's right? crazy. For almost two, we were, I mean, that's not a joke. You are not allowed to use the word insurgency. That came down from, you know, the Secretary of Defense and, 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 and Deputy Secretary of Defense, so Rumsfeld and Wolf, Wolfowitz's offices. I mean, because the, the use of that term was insulting to them. It implied that, the, that this was not a liberation, right? That, right. I mean, same thing too. You could not use the term occupation. There, you know, um, and then so finally, you know, when we are allowed to use the word insurgency, you can actually, because how do you, again, when we were talking like Filkins, how do you actually deal with the problem if you cannot accurately define it? And, and there's if, if, right? Petraeus is Mr. Counterinsurgency, isn't he? Then it was, exactly. Then there became all that. And then it become, which fades into another part of, uh, you know, the thinking in the American empire. Um, you know, you get into more of the liberal interventionists, which define 
you know, the Samantha Powers, the Susan Rices, the David Petraeuses. Um, I don't think Hillary Clinton actually believes those things. I think she just you just thought that, you know, a, a war in Libya would be a good thing for her politically. Um, you know, but certainly uh, you have all those people um, who believe who are who believe in the American empire. And just as the neoconservatives believe in American exceptionalism, these people do as well. It's just in a different way. They believe that they are actually going to be doing rather than um, rather than I think where the way to describe, like, say, the neoconservatives, the one who want the ones who want the new nation building uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, who wanted to raise uh, the, these brown people, these savages up to our level. That was their goal. Right. Bring these people up the white man's burden, um, because there's also an extraction benefit to that. If you rate, if you develop those countries, develop their economies or infrastructure, or human capital, well, because the empire is always extracting from them, there is now going to be more to extract. So there's a greed to this that underlies it. You know, this is not a benevolence. While with the, with the say the left, the democratic side of that, uh, you know, I think best that epitomized by Samantha Powers, um, it's an idea that we are rescuing these people, that we are the heroes, we are the ones with the white hats, that we will come in and save them even if we're saving them from wars of our own wars and uh, disasters and catastrophes of our own, uh, you know, making. The third element of this that we see, the third element in the empire you see, I think with, with Donald Trump's, uh, who, with Donald Trump, who he put in office, uh, guys like Jim Mattis, John Kelly, H.R. McMaster, Mattis was Secretary of Defense, Kelly was Homeland Security Secretary until he became White House Chief of Staff, and H.R. McMaster, uh, who uh, was now Security Advisor after Michael Flynn, uh, was was forced to resign, thankfully. Um, but I, I think what you see with these men and that type of thinking is a, a view of the empire uh, that there is no benevolence, there is no extraction in these borderlands, there is no other purpose than subjugating them. These are are whereas I think with um, say like the the, the Wolfowitzes and the Powers, uh, where they I think the book book that best epitomizes their philosophy is Francis Fukuyama's end of history, right? That describes uh, the end of the Cold War as the culmination of idea and thought for political and economic uh, ideas and that the West, what the liberal democracy, uh, capitalism represent the end of history. Nothing else can come. This is, we've reached the pinnacle. I think that adequately explains, not perfectly, but adequately explains a lot of the Wolfowitzes and powers. But I, I think to understand the Mattises and the Kellys uh, and the McMasters, you have to look at Sam Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, where we are a civilization, we are uh, the pinnacle of, 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 of history, and there are these borderlands, these frontier lands that threaten us, that these are the barbarians, and we have to subjugate them. Uh, the expression, may, I'm sure your listeners have heard before, uh, that United States Special Operations and CIA uh, people use is mowing the grass. You know, the idea that we have to continuously be there mowing the grass, right? So uh, I, I think what you see uh, over these last 20 years is three um, branches or, or three sections or sects of uh, those who support and believe in and work for the American empire, but their underlying views are all different as to what they want to achieve and why they want to achieve. And I don't, I don't think there's a hierarchy though between them in terms of which is more insidious and which is more nefarious and which is more damaging because they certainly have all uh, brought about, um, you know, unimaginable suffering. You know, I had this interview um, uh, this week with uh, Spanish television and um, the way I communicated to them about Afghanistan was that, you know, imagine, you know, I mean, certainly the Spaniards can understand it in a sense of the horrors of the, the civil of the Spanish Civil War, a war that was genocidal in many ways, a war that um, the term Holocaust has been applied to. The Spanish used that term to describe uh, the Spanish Civil War. Um, I've seen that. And because it was so uh, horrific and such a, a, a bloodletting um, and, you know, and but then understanding Afghanistan through that understanding of their own history. Um, explaining that, well, rather than several years and then uh, during a dictatorship for decades, it's 40 plus years of that bloodletting just continuing, right? Um, so, but uh, here in the United States, I don't think we, many of us, if most of us can understand how just uh, 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 
cruel and brutal uh, the suffering of the Afghan people has been. And that extends as well to the Yemenis, the Iraqis, the Syrians, all throughout Africa, right? Yeah, so. Can we go to that faction point for a second? Because I think that's really interesting. It's mm -hmm. also interesting to watch um, the rebrand of the neocons, which I've watched very closely. And Robbie Martin created a great documentary called A Very Heavy Agenda, which is expensive. But he goes and you watch because General Petraeus, for example, whose star was on the rise and had all these neocon connections, even let Fred Kagan and his wife have a kind of special role when he was in yeah, country. Yeah. It's yeah. like a, even though they're not in the military, they're part yeah. of his staff. They're clearing his speeches. Very weird. Um, Fred Kagan's brother, uh, Robert Kagan, who was probably was advisor to m most presidents, actually, has kind of it's funny. He's mixing a lot of what you're talking about. He has a book literally called The Jungle Grows Back, which is basically I mean, that's that's Kipling. That's white man's burden. Yeah, couldn't, you couldn't put it better than that. But he's also stepped back from calling himself a, you know, the project for new American centuries gone. Then there was an institute for the study of war and they've kind of played this game. But he's also starting to call himself a liberal interventionist, and he backed Hillary Clinton. Bill mm -hmm. Kristol is now publicly positioning himself as a Democrat, as someone who's le leaning towards Democrat ever since America First, I guess, took over the Republican Party, which I don't think is complete. So it it's funny to see this rebranding. But among those factions, you have to wonder, as I see these international press all write these, honestly, eulogies for the American empire, particularly the Anglosphere. The Brits have completely lost their minds. They took, you know, yeah. they slammed them in parliament. They gave this very weird uh, theatrical speech and their, their columnists and the Telegraph and others are saying the American empire is over. Where are we going to go now? But I do wonder among the factional infighting, does anyone say, because this is what they're resisting, right? Manage to climb. Can we somehow unwind this empire and it seems like the fight is not about that at all, even though that seems to be what you would think realistically should do. It says, how do we reband? How do we reposition ourselves to put a new coat of paint on the empire, kind of shine <laughs> it up and then redeploy it? And so how can we, you know, how can we do this again? I, I think um, one of the things when we discuss these factions is that some of, of, of what they profess are simply just conceits or are, are, are not. Um, I, you know, you did not see with the uh, liberal interventionists in Obama, we really did not see the nation building that you would have expected from liberal interventionists. You saw that from the neoconservatives, uh, but with the liberal interventionists, you really did not see the nation, except for in Afghanistan, uh, but in the wars that came about uh, uh, in this, particularly the second half of Obama's term, uh, although they actually got started at the, the end of the first half, at the end of end of his first term, you know, particularly say, uh, you know, Yemen, Syria, expansion of the wars all through Africa, there is not that heavy presence of American uh, 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 military corporations uh, doing good, uh, so to speak. Um, it really becomes down to their liberal intervention. Really, it's about the uh, the policy of R three P, responsibility to protect, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, which is something, again, that Samantha Powers uh, 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 speaks to quite a bit. Uh, Samantha Powers, who is now in charge of the United States Agency for International Development, and I'm sure as many people on this podcast know, has been uh, USAID. When I was in, when I was, uh, in the U.S. government, part of the U.S. government, uh, the, the saying about USAID was that some of the joke was, what's the most secretive organization in the U.S. government? And you would think, CIA, NSA, DIA, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's USAID. Uh, I mean, the, the, the role that USAID plays in these wars as being um, you know, a cutout, as being able to sink money into places is, is, is vital. Uh, the, you know, and I also have to remember, remember too, with the American military money, um, the way the American military describes money is they have a doctrine called money as a weapon system. So there's no benevolence whatsoever. The money is used to achieve military and political objectives. But I, you know, I, I think with, with these elements in terms of uh, what you're getting at, Dan, rebranding, I think we have, people will say, and you hear this a lot now, will the United States learn its lesson from Afghanistan? And the United States has already learned its lesson from Afghanistan, and it has over the last 10 years, beginning in the Obama administration, as the Obama administration expanded these wars, doing so in a hidden manner, doing so in a covert manner. I mean, so the fact that now American warfare in the Muslim world 
is dominated by uh, CIA teams, special operation forces, and drone strikes. Uh, all three of those are covert a activities. They are officially secret. Uh, so the United States government doesn't even have, a, have an obligation to lie about them because under U.S. law, the United States government is not allowed to talk about them. Um, congressional oversight is, is completely minimized uh, when you have these things. You have such even even uh, members of Congress who are very involved with the military and who are cheerleaders for the military, like Lindsey Graham, have almost no idea what's going on, say, in Africa. Remember, in, it's several years ago when, when four American soldiers, I believe it was four, were killed in Niger. Um, Lynn Senator Graham, again, who's, I mean, the guy, if, if you're going to brief anybody about what you're doing, you're going to brief Graham because he's going to support you. You know, Graham said he had no idea we had soldiers in Niger. In, in Niger. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the rebranding is just that, is, is, is making these wars hidden. You know, another thing is to use contractors, right? I mean, because contractors are hidden. You cannot submit, submit a FOIA request for contractors. Again, give you an example, USAID, you, to, get the, to get information from USIID uh, about certain things they do, you literally have to take them to court. They claim privilege when dealing with private corporations, and they defend that to the point of, of, of practically going to court. And at times, it's been that way for people to get information from them uh, because they will de deny FOIA requests and things like that. You know, so the only way to get information about what a U.S. corporation is doing is to subpoena them, right? So you got to get a court to subpoena them. In order to get a court to, to subpoena something like that because of the way our legal process works, right? And again, something your folks are very familiar with, whether it be with torture, surveillance, drone strikes, you have to have standing, right? So how do you get standing to, you know, so how are you going to get a U.S. court to subpoena an American corporation that is doing work on behalf of the U.S. government in Nicaragua, say? You're not going to get that because you have no standing. So co contractors, private corporations, are an amazing way to hide things. And then the, the third way, the third way of, of, of redoing these wars, of learning the lesson, is to use proxy forces. You know, uh, look, just, just, just even right now, uh, as we're talking, uh, you know, and this is again Thursday of this week, uh, you know, reports are of the, the, the suicide blast uh, in, uh, at the airport and dozens of people potentially killed. Uh, but if you right now look at any of the American major media, it, simply, it says, you know, big print, American Marines killed in Kabul. And then you literally have to go to like the second or third paragraph to see how there are literally dozens of Afghans there because the brown people don't count. So as long as it's black people killing black people, brown people killing brown people, again, we get into the narrative of how wrong uh, the narrative, uh, how wrong our understanding of the histories of these wars have been. You know, you get the argument like Filkins made. These people are always killing each other. They've always been fighting. I mean, how often have you heard that? I mean, think about, I mean, the best example, of course, right, is, is the issue, is situation with Palestine, you know, with the Palestinians in Israel. Oh, they've been fighting for, they've been fighting for thousands of years. No, they haven't. I mean, <laughs> it's happened. You know what I mean? Like, so, um, I mean, that's another way you get, if it's, if it's, it's black people killing black people, brown people killing brown people, the American public is not going to notice because American politicians don't care and the American media is not going to cover it. So that's, that's what, that's the lesson learned uh, in these wars by the U.S. military. It's already been learned and it was learned, uh, you know, by the end of the Bush administration, they had under, uh, they had learned it. The escalation of the war by Obama, where he ends up basically with a quarter million man army in Afghanistan. And if people think that somehow the U.S. didn't try hard enough in Afghanistan, just please remind them that at the height of that war, the U.S. had a quarter million man army in Afghanistan, 100,000 U.S. troops, 40,000 NATO troops, and more than 100,000 contractors. That's a quarter million men and women fighting that war, uh, plus Afghan forces, you know, spending more than $100 billion a year, plus doing whatever the uh, CIA was doing. We know that the CIA forces at times have ranged anywhere from as, 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 as lo little as 10,000 to maybe as 25,000 proxy forces in Afghanistan. And these men and those forces are very capable, they're very effective, they're very brutal. Um, they do their job as proxies very well. So I, I think with understanding um, how the American empire moves forward, they've already begun to move forward. Uh, you certainly the loss of Kabul and the loss of these air bases is a humiliation for the United States empire. And it is a loss for the American military and American CIA. Absolutely. They, they would have wanted to retain 
Bagram Air Base. I mean, it's you've got an air base in the center of the world, basically. Why would you not want that? It, but the, it's not a crippling loss. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a debilitating loss. It mainly means Afghanistan more or less falls into the fold of the way that the United States is conducting its wars in the Muslim world. Again, wars that stretch from uh, the west coast of Africa all the way to Pakistan. Um, you know, and 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 wars that. Um, you know, largely go unnoticed and, 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 and unspoken about. So I think we, I wish we could talk to you for longer, um, but I think we need to wrap up the main part of the interview. Do you have um, a little bit more time for a bonus yeah, question? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so this is a, we talked a little bit about the opium trade in Afghanistan. Uh, but there have been, I mean, this is a subject that needs a lot more discussion, in my, my opinion, deeply personal to me for a, a number of reasons um, that don't have to do with this war. But so the Taliban vows to shut down the opium business. Mm -hmm. uh, we, if you look at the numbers, uh, the opium trade went to I mean, almost nothing uh, during that brief time when, I guess, was it like 2000 or something like that, yeah. when the Taliban were in charge. 2001, it's back big and it's grown a lot during the entire occupation when we've been there. Um, so the Taliban says they're going to shut it down. We know that it is a major part of the local economy. Uh, we, you know, um, I heard an interview with you and Danny Sherson with Aaron Maté. You talked a little bit about it. Um, it's just so integrated into the economy in Afghanistan. So based on what you've seen, like from the local economy, um, how the money uh, from this trade flows, like you said, uh, there are uh, the government, all, you know, all the way up to the, the top internally in Afghanistan, there were people who were making money off of this. Uh, different degrees. And it, it's logical to say that people all around the world, there's money laundering that mm -hmm. banks do all of that. So do you think it's plausible that they're really going to shut down this trade? And if it does, just to base your experience, like how, how would something like that come about? The answer to the bonus question is in the extra bonus segment for patrons. You can get access to all bonus content by subscribing at Rockfin or Patreon, plus other perks like patron live streams, Zoom calls, and access to our Discord channel where we can talk among ourselves. So that's my pitch, and I hope that some of you will join us. And now I'll continue with the interview wrap up. Yeah. Well, Matt, please come back and talk to us again soon. Love talking to you. Um, but for now, I think we better let you go. Please tell everybody how to follow your work, how to support your work, which organizations you're with right now, and um, how to contact you, all that good stuff. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am uh, I'm a, I'm a, a senior fellow with the Center for International Policy, a uh, member of the Eisenhower Media Network, so please go and check out those organizations. Um, I have a website that I don't update very regularly. It's matthewho.com. Um, I'm also on Twitter, so Matthew P, P as in Patrick Ho, um, and uh, yeah, if I write with the occasional, with sometimes, you know, get something someplace, but most of my writing is you can find on Counterpunch, so another uh, great thing to support is Counterpunch, but also please support, you know, the work that, you know, Joanne and Dan are doing here, um, and yeah, of course, anytime, happy to come back. And anywar.com too. I've and anywar.com, yep, yeah, exactly, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for listening. A special thanks to Matthew Ho. Follow Matt on Twitter at Matthew P. Ho. And on Facebook, find his recent writings at Counterpunch, Anti-War, and on his website, MatthewHo.com. This podcast is independent media. Listener support's really important. Rockfin.com slash Around the Empire patreon.com slash around the empire paypal.me slash around the empire pod you can find us on any mobile podcast app all the information you need is on around the empire.com 
don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Also follow on Twitter at Around the Empire and join us on Telegram. And we'll see you next time. Take good care, everybody. Hang in there.